Um, we're also going to touch base today as we ha um, have our conversation with you on what we all feel very grounded in, which is the six core values of the social work profession. Service, uh, social justice, dignity and worth of the individual, importance and centrality of human relationships, integrity and competence. Part of why we were compelled to share um, what we've been working on is that we believe and know that we're doing, with the, we're doing this with and through many of you that are currently in the field, serving um, your clients, um, serving individuals, families, the organizations and communities in the middle of COVID, COVID an unprecedented time and staying grounded and um, clear about what brings us to this work is what we believe in this moment is part of what can help us to persevere. So we thank you for that. Um, for those of you who are students, um, thank you too. We know this is a really unusual and, and scary and difficult time for many of you. Not being able to be active in your placements and not being able to be with people, which is obviously probably what drew you to the field. Um, we're hoping that today might be an opportunity for you to think um, perhaps how might you situate yourself in terms of the work that you do with individuals, families, or communities, and think about the larger systems thinking that we all steep ourselves in child welfare, excuse me, in uh, social work. And so um, what we'd like to do with you today is we're gonna just talk through a little bit of the backdrop of what we would call um, the, the social work mindset. And then we want to actually step through with you because, because we believe it's really important. It's not just the why, which is what brings us to social work every day, but it's the what and the how that we're doing it. So we've each gonna, we're each gonna share some different kinds of examples with you about the kinds of things we've been working on together over the last three years um, in terms of transforming our health and human serving system and then we're also going to talk about, we're going to take some time too, to really talk about how to be social work leaders in the middle of this kind of a crisis, which we all know is unprecedented. And I just have to do a special call out. Um, Chris Antonello and I both hold, you know, certainly important roles and, and we're, we feel privileged every day to be serving um, in this COVID crisis. But Lisa and her team at public health are really the front lines of our department. And we're gonna get to hear from her in particular, which I think is really, um, really special for you today. So um, with that, can we switch to the next slide, please? So what you've got with the three of us, and we just have our, our pictures on the next slide. Um, and the reason we um, are sharing that is in part, we, we um, share cross-cutting roles in, in our Department of Health and Human Services. Sometimes folks aren't, don't realize that actually the Division of Public Health is actually one of six divisions within the Department of Health and Human Services. And so um, what we, again, feel like we're bringing and we're going to talk with you about today is how Chris and I and Lisa have really worked together over the last three years to draw, to build off our relationships and to draw the connections across each of the systems that we lead, that we manage, that we operationalize each and every day, and, and why we believe that's really helped us to move much of our systems transformation efforts forward and to be leading through the crisis today. Next slide. So what is systems thinking really? Well, um, we're gonna look at our next slide in just a minute and we'll talk a little bit about what systems thinking is. But, but, but I, I often share when I talk with folks about um, why I approach the work, the, the work that I do as an associate commissioner at, at DHHS with a systems lens is I actually think that social workers are a lot like engineers. We're social engineers. And much of what we do is really think about what's the right schematic or what's the right blueprint to have as a backdrop to the, to the work that we do, whether it's with an individual or a family or a team or an organization or community. What is the backdrop that underpins everything that that individual, that that person is within their environment? What are they experiencing? And then with that in mind, what are the strengths and the capacities that they either have or that they aspire to or that they could be built towards in order to really meet the challenges in their lives 
in their experiences as an organization, in their communities, to evolve and change and grow. And really what, we're, what we all know we're talking about, particularly with COVID right now, is how can they adapt? How can they continue to strive to thrive, to strive to survive, um, and all of the in-between? And finally, and potentially most importantly, is really to think about how we can support individuals and families in what is the space of equity in terms of the how each person connects within their environment we know that there are a variety of disparate disparities there are a variety of structural challenges there are a variety of individual um, identities that people bring that we need to be thinking about as we create transformation as we respond to crisis so that we're really considering what, that we're not leaving any one person, individual, or group behind. I want to open it up right now to just ask Chris and Lisa to maybe add a few of their thoughts in any one of these areas before we go forward. So this, hi everybody, thank you very much um, for having us on this day. It's really um, great um, to be here and I really think that um, for me personally and professionally, you're just really focusing um, on really looking at families and individuals really in their environment and their communities. And I think for me, which I'll get into a little bit later as, as to our division, that has been um, key through all of our work um, and, and really looking at the strengths and capacities um, and building off of those and really building community. And I think we're seeing more and more of that, um, which is very refreshing. Lisa? Lisa, you're on mute. Got it. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks uh, both to, to the Chris's and to everybody um, on the call. So, in public health, we tend to think of we we are system minded. So, rather than focus on individuals and families um, as they as they are individually, we focus on populations and the impact of their environment. Uh, on their health. So um, it's a very different way of looking at the world. Uh, that was one of the things that I had to learn and transition from social work to, um, to uh, public health. But what I have learned and what we have learned, and I think Chris Tappen will attest to this, uh, both Chris, is that uh, really you have to look at both, that, that it's, it's vitally important to be uh, thinking about people as they are and the different uh, experiences they have as well as to look at uh, populations and the impact of their environment on their health. Great. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. Um, some of the tools that I think all of you know are familiar um, in the social work field, like genograms and ecomaps in particular, help us to really create a frame of reference when we're trying to think about the individual and situating them within the context of their environment. When we look across a frame of reference like this, this is the larger from the individual at the very center and the microsystem that they um, most often from day to day are moving about. We'll talk about that in just, a, a, in just another minute around social determinants of health. What we would encourage all of you and what we feel like we live in is we really live in this larger meso, exo, and macro systems. What we collectively call the larger ecosystem. And as both Lisa and Chris were talking about, much of what we're constantly thinking about is how can we apply social work core values and the systems thinking framework at the individual level, but in a parallel process way also with and across all of the um, connections we have with our staff, with our varying program areas, and with key stakeholders that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. The reality is, is that we all know, just like we know when we come to an individual or a family, we don't hold all the solutions. We don't hold all the ideas. We don't hold, we don't have the understanding, the depth of experience, lived experience that they do in the challenges that they have in their lives. It's the same in the system. And so part of what the three of us have done as leaders is we have strived to build off of our relationships, 
to make those connections and to really bring new evidence-based, excuse me, evidence-based ways of collaborating together into and across the larger systems thinking framework. Can you go to the next slide? As a foundation to all of this, one of the things that really comes much through the health lens and through the public health lens into the social work and human services sphere is the idea that if you lay underneath a systems thinking framework, the social determinants of health, which Lisa is going to talk a little bit more later about in detail, um, and Chris and I are going to talk about how we frame those, this as part of our transformation roadmap, is that this is the idea of that each and every day we need to be thinking about how, where are people living? Where are they learning? Where are they working? Where are they growing? Where are they recreating? Where are they eating? How are they accessing healthcare and moving about? And when we don't think about those things collectively and we move ourselves towards solutions in only one sphere or two spheres of someone's life, we actually run a significant risk as a system of winding up being sort of whack-a-mole, where we're trying to work on one problem, homelessness. Then we're trying to work on another problem, food insecurity. And we're trying to work on another problem, economic mobility. And the reality is that these are interwoven across the entire ecosystem every day for every individual, for every family, for every community and for every organization that's trying to do this work. So what I'm going to step into now is a few examples of from, from my um, sort of seat in the chair here at DHHS that I have been either leading or collaborating with others around, um, much of which both all the ones that I'm going to touch on have been both with Chris and with Lisa in their roles as well. And so if we go to the next slide, and go to the next slide, maybe two more. I'm gonna talk about if we wanna do this um, work looking through the social determinants of health lens, and we wanna do it across our health and human serving system, we really have to redefine what is this serving system and how does it work together? Can you press the forward just once? So this is how much of we have been operating in social work and in the health and human serving system. And I'm gonna use those two kind of interchangeably right now, although I do think that social work brings um, sort of a, a unique lens and a unique set of skills and tactics um, to the health and human serving environment. The reality is, and we need to own this, and as students, I would encourage you to be very aware of this, that when any one of us comes and says, I'm going to be someone who works in housing, or I'm going to be someone who works in child welfare, or I'm going to be someone who helps people with economic assistance or with mental health. When you come to your work in just one silo, unfortunately, and if you can move to the next slide, what you could be missing is the reality that the individual the team, the organization, the family that you're trying to work with, they're moving about in a complex and adaptive system. It's constantly changing every day. And your best skill set can be bringing an awareness of the ideas and solutions that you're building with them together. How might those impact any one of those varying social determinants of health for them? When we don't touch on those, again, we miss out when we try to only deal with the family's transportation issue or only with their housing issue. The challenge becomes that we didn't listen to understand a health concern. We didn't listen to understand a practical issue with childcare, a, a challenge with the job they're worried about losing. And so in order, and if you can press the next button, in order to keep our eye on the bullseye, where that individual and family are at, we have to constantly be thinking outside of our silos, connecting across with our colleagues, thinking through the existence of how we can move about and have awareness of all of this collectively impacting those we're trying to help. So I'm gonna give an example of how we've done that. If you can go to the next one. At DHHS over the last couple of years, we've really begun a conversation about integration. 
And integration meaning really the blending or bringing together of programs, the unsiloing, the, the blending of policy, of program design and management and evaluation, of funding mechanisms that come down from all different funding streams in the federal government and through our state regulatory and funding process, how do we connect the dots and bring those together? Well, at the root of our capability has been building relationships. And then in order to help people understand this, and really, again, I have to give attributes, our colleagues at the Division of Public Health, both Lisa and her Deputy Division Director, Trish Tilly, introduced us to a process called Boundary Spanning Leadership. And in that, we delve deep into how can we look across, um, look across all that we do collectively and create direction and alignment and commitment to our work, which includes stepping away from turf, um, taking some risk, understanding data and how to integrate it, and most importantly, how to do this learning and doing together. So what we've done across DHHS is we've established a series of integration teams. And these are teams that cut across all of our divisions, those, those nice circles, each of those is a division. Notice they're not boxes, they're circles. Um, and we cut across all of the divisions. And here's an example of the integration teams that we've been operating um, over the last couple of years. I'm gonna move through and highlight just three of these right now and what the results have been from those. But just to be clear, these are entities that people get together and they decide on their vision, their direction, their goals. They commit to actions, actionable tasks. They bring data to the table. And the idea is that they're working across and within their programs. And I'll add that we've incorporated in our integrations a lot of work with the Department of Education, also the Department of um, Safety, in areas such as um, early childhood and school safety, as just a couple of examples. To the next slide. I think many of you know that we have um, been embarking the last couple of years on major child welfare reform in the state of New Hampshire. Um, from early on, we had decided that reform of the child welfare system, just going from bad to good, wasn't good enough for New Hampshire. And so we really decided that we were gonna embark on a transformational effort um, around child welfare. And we targeted four different areas, responding to the crisis that we had at hand, strengthening relationships and partnerships, innovating around using data to drive decision-making and create a culture of learning, and a heightened focus on prevention, which is where our public health partners have been so critical. And finally, in now we've moved into this place of constructing really um, much more comprehensive approaches um, to safety and reduction of future trauma. And if you go to the next slide, the whole idea here was to align what the CDC tells us is the definition of child abuse and how to address it. And this comes from the CDC that really child abuse and neglect are actually re the result of a whole mix, thousands of interactions that are happening for a family across a system. And if we don't take a systems approach, a socio-ecological approach, we really won't be able to solve child abuse and neglect and we'll constantly be responding once the abuse or the neglect has occurred, once the trauma has occurred, instead of actually preventing the trauma in the first place. I'm gonna go on, if you can go on to the next slide. Another example that we've been working on is this idea of economic mobility. So a connection between child welfare and economic mobility or families who are living in poverty is that we know that 70% of the kids and families that are coming to the front door of DCYF here in New Hampshire are coming with neglect as the identified concern. Most of that is related to chronic economic challenges, lack of food, lack of housing, lack of um, constancy of employment, healthcare, all the kinds of things that kids need in terms of um, social and emotional supports and resources. And so in New Hampshire, we embarked um, about two years ago on um, an effort to really look across uh, the entire family, taking a multi-generational approach, working with business and philanthropy to really think about how can we cross cut the social determinants of health and create economic mobility for all families. And again, getting parents to work while keeping an eye on opportunities for kids to thrive. 
Chris is going to talk just a little bit more about this as her division has been leading a lot of this work. And the last area I want to talk about, if you can go to the next slide, is around early childhood. Many of you might be familiar that for the last 10 years or so, we've had um, an effort called Spark New Hampshire. That really laid some amazing groundwork for us in understanding early childhood and the investments that we can make in young children and their parents, in their families and their communities. Um, and what their return on investment, both for that child and that, that family, but for society can be when we do that right. And so we actually, um, there is an executive order that lines up with a new Council for Thriving Children um, that we established um, back in January that actually cross cuts. And if you could push the button one more time, I think we have one of the squares missing, I'm noticing. Oh, no, I guess it's just missing. Back it up. <laughs> um, but this cross cuts, we're missing that actually down in the right hand quad, uh, bottom quadrant there is we actually have the University of New Hampshire actually playing a lead role in our expert advisory group. Um, but as you'll see, this actually takes on the blue side. This takes our governmental agencies, responsibility and accountability. It joins it with our stakeholders, our advocates, our families with lived experience, and then our experts from the University of New Hampshire. And it all combines it together in what is a, a real strong governance structure with communication flowing up and through the governor's council for thriving children. That includes stakeholders. Again, parents are at the forefront of this, grandparents. And the idea here is really to, in a much more coordinated way, across and with through the system at the state level, the local community level, and for the family in their own community and where they live every day to create a better, more seamless, coordinated um, response and support effort. And so with those three examples, I'm going to actually pass off now um, to Chris Santanella and have her talk about her work. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, Lynn, can you go ahead to the next couple slides? My name is Chris Santanello, and I'm here at our Division of Economic and Housing Stability. I've actually been with the department for about three and a half years. I think I came a month before Lisa <laughs> Morris. Um, we used to work together a lot in the community. And prior to coming um, here to the department, I ran a nonprofit corpor corporation. And one of the, um, I think that always struck with me actually since my early days of social work and graduate school was really around looking at um, the person in their home community, in their home, and always working to support, not supplant services that a community and or a family can provide um, for their family member. And I think that that's really grounded me in all of my work and my work today. So you're gonna see um, in our Division of Economic Housing Stability, we're really as far left um, as you can go um, in the scheme of providing supports um, to individuals and families. And we really believe that, you know, if we can provide some of the services within um, the Division of Economic and Housing Stability, like financial assistance, employment, um, child support, the number one poverty reducer for children and families, um, child development, um, and housing supports, really we can set families off um, to be really um, as independent as possible um, and really not leading, needing some of the services um, that are much more intrusive when you get into the Division for Children, Youth, and Families and long-term supports and services. And so what our goal is to provide the right services at the right time, at the right door with the right connection um, for individuals and families we serve. Can you move to the next slide, please, Lynn? Um, our division is relatively new. We've been coming together since June of 2018. And our mission is pretty simple. It's advancing the health, economic, and social well-being of individuals, families, and communities. And our vision is that individuals and families are strong, resilient, and thriving in their communities. We believe strongly um, that individuals and families um, need to be part of their community and strong families make strong communities. Um, what's been interesting is all of the programs within our Division of Economic and Housing Stability were all operating in their own silos prior to our division coming together. Um, and, and by coming together, 
we were all working with the same, many of the same individuals and families and coming together um, and getting to know one another and finding common ground has really prepared us, I think, really well for this COVID um, crisis that we're in right now. Um, I think for me personally, um, prior to coming to this division, I was leading our division of long-term supports and services, but I always had a strong vision, um, especially when I worked in the community, is to um, how do I impact systems? How do I help systems um, and provide the tools and resources for individuals to be as independent as possible? whatever that may mean. And I think um, really I go back, I, I've been thinking a lot about my um, graduate school's day and really how do you, how do communities influence a person and family and how to really strengthen families, we need to um, strengthen communities. And that's really how I've operated in my role and how I still think about our work today and how do we influence the larger um, policy um, levers to support individuals and families where they need to be. Um, next slide, please. So here is the scope. Whoops. Lynn, can you advance the next slide? Oh, great, thank you. Um, we serve individuals and families from birth on through the lifespan. And so um, we really do have an ability um, to um, influence um, outcomes for individuals and families. We provide a whole person, whole family approach, and we're always going back to what is the impact on the family? How is what we're doing today impacting the family, the life of the child, the life of the family? Um, I'll talk a little bit about the importance of social determinants of health and its impact on the person and family, and reducing programmatic and system um, barriers and silos to services. I know I used to get really frustrated um, lots of times with all the silos that would be in place for an individual and family and really how do we really best wrap around um, some of the services and I think part of it by always um, having that lens of um, being um, of the individual and family. Um, we create synergies and coordination of efforts and we focus on strengthening program organization to create solutions and, it, and we provide shared leadership. I think of back to um, some of my work and it was super early, like early in my um, career um, and we were working with families in early intervention. Well, now it's early supports and services but I will call it early intervention for my entire life and I can remember I had a um, physical therapist and she was an amazing physical therapist. And she came into my office one day all upset because she didn't get to do physical therapy with this child. And she was like, I didn't get to touch Joey. Like I didn't get to do his range of motion. And I said, well, what did you do for an hour and 15 minutes? And she said, I helped um, the mother get her housing benefits, get social security sign up for food stamps at the time, now SNAP. And I said, so what you did is you helped the family be successful for a lifetime. And that's really what I see our role in our division is really how do we set the stage for the future success of that family? Um, can you have, um, take the next slide please, Lynn. And I keep on thinking about with COVID, what are the silver linings to all of this? Because we're doing some pretty remarkable um, things with our benefit structure and supporting individuals and families to get them quick access to services so they can continue um, to maintain their, their home. And, and I don't want to lose that. And so we're already having talks with some of our um, national um, and federal partners on how do we build off of this? How do we build off these silver linings that we've created um, for our staff and um, those that serve them? Um, so we talk a lot about in our department, the social determinants of health, and I think of the work of our division of economic and housing stability. We touch all of these social determinants of health. If, if a family doesn't have housing stability, how do we ever expect the child to do well in school? Um, how do we expect the family to be able to go to work? Yet all of those things are critical to the success of that child and that family. 
I often will say to staff, how many of you have moved in the last, you know, five or 10 years? And lots of people in the room will raise their hand. And I was like, well, how many of this was for a really positive time in your life? Either you bought your first home or you were able to buy a different home. Um, and how, for how many of you was that stressful? And then I think about the individuals and families we serve and how the constant moving oftentimes adds increased stress. And so how do we really wrap our services around the individual and family so that we're addressing all of these areas of the social determinants of health? And how do we link all of our programs so we're constantly thinking about this with the family and child at the center of all of our work? Can we have the next slide, please? Um, I, and again, here's an illustration how we really think about the person and family in their environment. And I think about my own life lots of times, you know, um, there's multiple stressors all at different times. And we, we're not sure necessarily what the stressors are for the individuals and families we serve and how do we streamline our support so that they're telling their story one time. How do we make sure the person they're talking to is able to understand what services those individuals and families um, need at all times. And I think we recognize that addressing sometimes an immediate need um, has a much better influence for a family. There's, there's no reason why if a family needs assistance with housing, we have to involve them in our division for, for children, youth, and families. We need to support that family with finding adequate and safe housing to meet the needs of their um, family at the time. Um, many families, I think, sometimes um, struggle with their basic needs, and I'm, we're really concerned right now um, with all of this COVID um, response, which has been incredible, but here we are in our Bureau of Housing Supports thinking about, okay, what happens when evictions are allowed again? How do we ensure that families have the resources they need so they're able to maintain their housing? So we're taking some of our federal dollars and investing in, in permanent and supportive housing because we feel that's what is needed for individuals and families. Um, I think we are now with our COVID work able to respond um, to meet the needs of individuals and families where they're at um, for success now and in the future. Lisa? Great, uh, thanks Chris, thanks Job. Um, can you uh, go to the next slide please, Lynn? So um, uh, I would like to introduce myself a little bit to you for those of you who don't know me. So um, my background is really in uh, behavioral health, older adult services and community development. And so when I went to work for the partnership, which was um, quite, a, quite a number of years ago, the reason that it worked so well for me was that I was able to incorporate the framework of social work, which is what I was doing prior to going to the partnership and continuing to do as part of our work at the partnership, but also to learn and understand the importance of looking at populations. And, and it's when they work together, as I said earlier, where we're looking at individuals and also looking at populations um, where, we get, uh, where we get the best um, outcomes. So, um, one of the things that I brought to the department or to the Division of Public Health was really understanding the importance of um, integrated work. Uh, prior to my coming, um, there was uh, the, many of the, and prior to actually the, both the Chris's coming as well, there was a lot of siloed work going on within the department. We were really focused on um, those areas that um, that we believed were, um, uh, were part of our subject matter expertise. And that's still true, but what we've learned is that, um, that it's only our subject matter expertise, so that um, the social determinants of health, along with health, really needs to work in parallel efforts or in integrated efforts. And uh, Chris Tappen talked about sort of the integration teams that we have formally, but um, informally all our work has moved from siloed efforts to more integrated efforts within the department and also with our, our partners in the community. On the other side, when I was doing more social work kind of uh, systems work, 
uh, the idea that health um, outcomes uh, we, we really thought of relative to stable housing or to, um, to uh, uh, reduction in domestic violence, for example, um, or whether or not somebody um, had access to services. But we, we really had limited view around um, sort of health outcomes and how important they are as we look to see uh, a more healthy, um, uh, a more health, healthier communities and healthy environments. So if you go to the next slide, um, Lynn, thank you. I think maybe they're out of board. Yes, thank you very much. So um, I just so that you have a sense on the work of public health. So our work is very focused on a disease uh, specific kinds of work. Um, now we understand the importance of integrating that work with uh, those who are focused on social determinants of health, although we are as well. So our focus is on protecting the health of all people in communities. We used evidence-based strategies that we know will improve health. And I know that's happening in social work and behavioral health and all aspects of the work that we're in, but that wasn't so true uh, in the past, at least in, in my experience. And that's relatively new within the last 10 or 15 years um, in the social work field. But uh, in the public health field, that's really always been the case. And, um, uh, moving outside of that is uh, very challenging for us, although the understanding that sometimes we do need to do that um, is vitally important. Uh, ensure access to high value preventative focused health care, uh, collect and analyze data. So one of the things that, um, that public health is focused on is really looking at the data relative to um, how populations are, um, are, are doing relative to overall health. And um, uh, one of the things that was not happening in the department uh, collectively was really using data to inform our, our strategies. And so I think that's one of the big areas that um, has changed uh, in addition to that um, evidence-based strategies around all areas of health and social determinants of health, social work um, and public health. Um, is that uh, data informs our next moves. And of course, we're all involved in improving health outcomes, but health outcomes is not just about um, uh, whether or not somebody's diabetes um, is, uh, uh, is um, managed, but also um, do they have safe and affordable housing, um, for example. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So. Um, uh, so we know that health happens on the community level, uh, and when we look at our public health system, our delivery system, uh, we're looking at um, every single sector uh, within communities, um, and this just goes to uh, the comments that we've all been making, all three of us, re relative to how we cannot work in silos, that we have to work in systems um, and in uh, integrated approaches. So uh, we focus on the community health centers. You, uh, many of you have them in your communities and I hope they are your partners. If they're not, they um, should be. Um, and I hope that they're engaging you as well. Uh, there are only two health departments other than the state health department in New Hampshire um, and that's in Manchester and Nashua. We have 13 public health networks. Um, uh, this is, um, these public health networks are um, most often attached to human service agencies. So um, uh, you, uh, your, the sector that you work in should be engaged within these networks um, as they are multi-sectoral. And then all the sectors contribute to health outcomes as we've been talking about. Could you go to the next slide, please? So um, I love this slide. This is a CDC slide that talks about uh, what are the um, factors that need to be in place in order to improve health in communities. Um, and again, when we talk about health, we are also talking about the social determinants of health. And if you look at the upper left-hand corner um, in terms of the impact on health, you can see that clinical care only, uh, um, only impacts health for in uh, relative to 20%, a small amount uh, of the needs uh, that we all need to improve, um, to improve our health and wellness. So health behaviors, asking people to eat healthfully or to walk every day, only 30%. Changing the physical environment uh, to allow 
for, um, uh, for healthier eating or healthier lives like uh, trails, rails and trails, only 10%. Um, but if you look at uh, social determinants of health or social economic factors, it's 40%. So this really goes to show the importance of where we uh, focus and uh, put our resources um, uh, throughout all of these sectors. Um, then it's really important in the center area to, uh, when we're looking at data, uh, to help inform us and, um, and tell us what strategies we need to implement and where they should be implemented, we have to look at the greatest area of need. So there are never enough resources to go around, so we have to look um, at, these, um, at these areas. Um, and typically, th this is where our disparate populations are residing equity is a really important part of the work in both social work and in public health. And uh, this is how we have an understanding of where to, where to put our resources. And then to the right, that collective vision, again, that idea, uh, if you hear every, anything today, um, and uh, I'm sure many of you hold this true in practice, that um, uh, we all need to be involved uh, in uh, planning and implementing our plan uh, collectively. So if you go to the next slide, that would be great. So just to show where we have moved uh, in public health, if you look to the right where um, you're looking at risk behaviors, disease, uh, and injury and mortality, this is where uh, the work of public health has, uh, has been uh, over the years historically. And if you move to the center where we're looking at uh, social inequities, institutional inequities and living conditions. Um, this is where um, we have been moving um, in this way. And uh, this also means that we, um, uh, we need to work with others um, who have the subject matter expertise uh, and parallel our plans uh, in an integrated way. So uh, please move forward. Oh, so, the, okay, sorry, I forgot about that. I think the next one goes to the uh, circle on the right as well. Okay, we can move to the next slide. So uh, Chris Tappan asked me to talk about some transformational work that we're doing other than what I have already been talking about. And um, uh, we in public health have had a state health improvement plan. I'm guessing many of you are not even familiar with that and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, so that state health improvement plan uh, went from 2013 to, 2000, to 2020, uh, which is this year and really focused on disease. Um, and so when I came here, um, it was my mission to ensure that the next state health improvement plan um, looked at uh, systems across the state of New Hampshire, looked at health and wellness, and was driven uh, by communities. Um, so uh, we are in the process now of working on um, our state health assessment, which uh, has to happen before our state health improvement plan. And this slide uh, really tells you what that process uh, looks like. So in the state health assessment, we're looking um, at data um, of the health and well-being in New Hampshire, and that is far exceeds data on um, health outcomes. It uh, also exceeds data on uh, uh, all of those social determinants of health that we've been talking about. Um, and then once we have that data to identify priorities, and those priorities uh, will be identified um, in the state health improvement plan, it will provide us the um, evidence-based practices that we all need in every sector to, um, to uh, move towards improved health outcomes. Um, it integrates services and it leverages resources. Um, and in communities, through your public health networks, there are uh, regional uh, public health improvement plans, and I would be interested in chat uh, to see how many of you have been involved in the development of your um, community health improvement plans, or what we like to call CHIP, um, as they are quite focused on, uh, uh, on um, social determinants of health in many ways. They're ahead of the state uh, in many ways. So if you move to the next uh, slide, please. So as part of this process, uh, this new uh, transformed process, is we have developed um, a state health assessment, state health improvement plan advisory council. It is multi-sector. We have about um, uh, 20 or more uh, uh, leaders uh, represent various sectors and populations in community, as well as uh, covering the geography of New Hampshire. And they are responsible for advising the state health improvement plan and the state health improvement plan, uh, the state health assessment and state health improvement plan process. Um, uh, 
this improvement plan is not a Department of Health and Human Services plan. It is a plan for New Hampshire. So their participation, their leadership, and uh, ensuring accountability of this process is of vital importance to this project. Um, next slide. So uh, as part of this council and the work that they're doing uh, that took many, many months to come up with a, um, um, a vision statement uh, that we look to each time we meet and as this process moves forward that all people in New Hampshire have equitable opportunity to flourish and achieve uh, optimal mental, physical, uh, social, spiritual, and emotional wellness. And then um, there are caveats that we need to pay attention to, which is uh, around equity and where equity um, has to happen, uh, which as at the state and local level. And that wellness happens where people uh, live, learn, work, play, and age, and that people include all individuals and families. So move to the next slide, please. So um, uh, this has um, this process uh, without um, uh, had really no motivational um, uh, reason uh, for uh, potential legislation, but uh, legislators became very interested in this process, and a um, a Stead Health Improvement Plan um, bill, uh, uh, Senate Bill Seven Eighteen, is. Um, out there now. Um, hopefully, uh, if the legislature will get back uh, to order and we'll be able to move this forward. But what's great about this is there has been no change to um, the um, advice um, of the State Health Assessment and State Health Improvement Plan. Uh, the language in this particular bill um, uh, parallels the language that um, the advisory group has uh, designed for this process. So we're very excited about this and um, uh, the fact that this has got a heightened level of awareness and interest amongst the legislature um, um, has uh, been very exciting to um, everyone um, involved. Um, and Lisa, could I, could I add something just real quick? Um, of course. So, so as a member of the um, state health assessment and state health improvement, um, this the plan team. Um, I, I just I, I can't um, emphasize enough how unusual and really incredible it is the membership of this group um, and the thoughtfulness that went into asking people to join. Um, so as an example of this connectivity across systems and across transformation efforts, um, for the first time, my understanding for the first time, there's actually representation from education. Mm -hmm. um, so not only do we have the Department of Education Deputy Commissioner Christine Brennan, who's been deeply involved in our early childhood transformation efforts, as well as behavioral health um, for kids, um, system of care, uh, mental health services at large, um, but also there's a superintendent who has been actively involved with our child welfare transformation efforts. And he is also a foster adoptive parent. And so we're really bringing a collection and that's just, that's just an example of two people. Um, I mean, it may be worthwhile, Lisa, to give a little bit more of a sense of all these people, but the reality is these people are um, bringing a variety of perspectives, not just their jobs, but the things that they're trying to collectively touch system-wide to this effort. And to have our health improvement plan for the first time really build on the social determinants of health and recognize uh, the disparities in the structural challenges that we have in some of our communities, it's really exciting. It is really exciting, yeah. So um, uh, I, it's important to note that although we do have some state representatives, I mean, when I say representatives, I'm not talking about the legislature, but um, uh, leadership within the state uh, agencies involved, the majority of the membership are external uh, partners. So we have philanthropy, we have um, the aging community, we have behavioral health, we have the disability world, we have peer support, we have a uh, substance use disorder, so the lit and uh, education, the list really goes on and on. And I, um, uh, I think the uh, one area, we, we actually have uh, the fisc, uh, um, uh, fiscal policy in there, the business community. So it's, um, I, really, I really believe that uh, we have not uh, missed any sector, but we realize that as we move forward, um, that um, if we need uh, 
additional sector involvement that we will certainly ensure that, um, that, that they are participating. We're also right now working on trying to figure out within a COVID world, how do we get um, the input from uh, our public? Um, so we had a really robust plan around uh, outreach to public. Uh, COVID has really put, um, uh, it's really made it a bit more challenging in order to do that. So even though we have outreach efforts that we are planning, um, we are aware that um, it's, it's uh, I'm going to use this word, but I'll try to explain it, clouded by COVID. So people's response uh, to overall questions are going to be relational to what they're experiencing now. It's very hard to move outside of COVID right now. So we understand that we're going to try to incorporate that um, into the plan as well as um, uh, the importance of uh, preparing uh, for crises um, uh, and having a continuity of operations planning um, within that this particular plan. So, so Lisa, I just want to, you just um, lightly touched on what I see as a question from Reb McKenzie. Um, okay. and I, I just want to acknowledge this is a really, really important question. And Chris, I might ask you to kind of help um, to respond to this if, if we can, Len, if that's okay. So I think um, Lisa's talking about absolutely there was a commitment, there continues to be a commitment around this state health improvement plan, including substantive local community engagement. And, and I would say um, it, it is stakeholders, but it is individuals with lived experience, people who are living in the communities, what are their experiences with these variant systems? Um, that's, gonna be, that's gonna be really critical. And unfortunately, we have had to we had to have to shift a little bit. Um, uh, we'll have to probably for a while in terms of how we do that engagement. But the commitment won't change. I, I'll just add we were beginning to roll out in terms of advancing transformation in the child and family serving system. We had just begun planning um, in early March um, a series of community forums that would have taken place over probably about a four to five month period. We had mapped out that would have gone to um, 10 communities throughout New Hampshire um, to really reach out to children and families who are touched by the larger child and family serving system. And the idea here was actually to connect it to the state health assessment, state health improvement plan as well, so that the two are really feeding and connecting into each other. But back to the drawing board just a little bit in terms of the tools and the technology that we have in front of us now. But I also want to um, talk a little bit, ask Chris to touch on, um, Reb mentioned that in her community, she lives in a small city, that there's an 18% poverty rate. Chris, would you mind talking just a little bit about the whole families and the yes. work, the economic analysis that we yeah. have? When I, when I saw Reb's um, comment, I wanted to um, touch on this. I think um, early on, Chris talked about our whole family's approach to jobs. And one of the children, Parents working, children thriving. I have to always say it once um, to make Chris Tapp and happy. So you have to say the whole thing. Um, but one of the things um, we look at is this phenomenon called the benefits cliff. And some of you um, may be familiar with this. And that's when somebody who is on public benefits either gets an advancement in their job or takes on a new job, but the loss of public benefits is greater than their um, than the income they're gonna realize. And so by taking a job, it puts their family more at risk um, for the short term and sometimes for the long term. And that's something we've been working on. And the department actually started looking at it a few years ago, but what is the cliff? And so we actually had um, legislation um, in House Bill 4 that charged us with doing an economic analysis and presenting a plan um, to the governor and legislature, and how are we going to solve this cliff effect? And what we wanted to do is really understand what are the levers that we need to look at, and what does it look like for New Hampshire? And so we started to um, work on an economic analysis, and we are using eConsult out of, um, I can't even remember where they're from. And, but Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Philadelphia. And yep. they're partnered with the um, Center for Children in Poverty um, at Columbia University at Bank Street School. And we're not just looking at the economic impact across the state. 
we've actually are started to do work with 40 different communities across the state and looking at um, what is the business climate? What is the economic climate? What are social vulnerabilities for those individual communities? And how will a, how would levers be pulled differently in different communities? So we were really moving really steadily um, to think about what recommendations, what's the level of families who are on Medicaid? What is the percentage of families receiving SNAP assistance? What is the income? What is the business climate in those areas? So we really can understand because I worked in the Lakes region and I knew that the community of Warren was very different than Plymouth. And how do we account for that um, in whatever policies we bring forward? So now fast forward, right? March, April, 2020, and the numbers of unemployment that is unprecedented in our state. And so now we're back kind of to the drawing board to look at now what's the impact of unemployment on these individual communities and looking through it with that same lens um, to see what do we need to provide in certain communities? Chris, anything else? No, that was a, that was a great overview. And really the heart of this, um, your question for a small city to have an 18% poverty rate, right? That, New Hampshire often is up at the top one, two, three. I think it was again first this year for ch child well being indicators. That's an average across the state. And what we've really begun to do is if you, I know there's a couple of folks on here who are from the Philippines and India. So some, we have some international colleagues on the call today. Is that when you look at what happened in community development inter internationally a, a good decade ago, they began to go hyper local. To, to really what they called localization, to really understand what was unique to that committee, that, that community, and to not use broad sweeping data points to make decisions. And so we're doing that in New Hampshire. And where what Chris is talking about is we're matching up. What are, the, what are the indicators between poverty, the opioid crisis, child maltreatment rates, child support collection, housing? What does it look like in each of these different communities the North Country, the Western part of the state, they have very different indicators than we do in Portsmouth, in Keene, or in Manchester. Um, and so we're really pushing our teams to go hyper-local, to think locally, and really, again, to have the voice of those individuals that live in those communities, um, and, and really make sure that's at the forefront of any of the solutioning that we're doing. So I think we're gonna move now to talk a little bit about COVID, and again, I'm going to turn it back over to Lisa. She and her team have been at the forefront of this. Chris and I are working deeply behind the scenes. Um, I shared with all of you um, a summary that was just written up by our federal partners. Um, we've essentially taken the integration teams that we had across the department, and we've created a super integration team. Uh, we meet every Tuesday afternoon for a couple of hours, and we dig deeply across all the social determinants of health into our pre-COVID data, our current COVID data, and now we're, of course, we're looking towards living with and through COVID. Um, and that those groups right now are digging deeper into our equity data. That's where we're at right now. Um, but that was written up and it gives you some examples of how we've been able to identify needs and gaps and meet those gaps with um, partners in philanthropy with and through each other's funding streams. Um, Chris Santanello has carried a lot of conversations to our federal government partners, really working through what are um, some waivers and flexibilities that we've had, particularly in the economic sphere with unemployment. That kind of income really hits people's benefits. And so Chris has done an amazing job with her team keeping that going and keeping um, pe income coming into people's homes for the time being. Now we have to tack and adjust back to that adaptability point. Um, so I'm going to let Lisa talk a little bit about how COVID is organized from a structural standpoint and how that's being teamed across the department from a systems perspective. Great. You could go to that. I think it's maybe the next two slides. So uh, I don't expect you to read this, uh, but uh, this is the State of New Hampshire Incident Command structure uh, that allows us as a state to respond to the COVID crisis. Um, and all 
of these boxes, there are uh, many people involved uh, through the Emergency Operations Center, um, uh, Unified Command, um, uh, and uh, this, is, this, this is not public health. So, but public health is, uh, is represented here under Health and Human Services branch. Um, so, um, in the past, when we have outbreaks, um, disease outbreaks in New Hampshire, public health, um, this is what we do. This is core to our work, to investigate these outbreaks and to mitigate these outbreaks. Um, and so, again, uh, we are typically working um, and report, working here uh, in an isolated way from the rest of the state and reporting out our, uh, the, the kinds of things that are going on. You may recall last summer we had a Legionella outbreak in, um, in Hampton Beach, and uh, that was uh, one of the first times that we started to work with other sectors um, uh, in planning and response activities. Um, typically, that's, that's not the case. But now, uh, with this unprecedented event, um, it is uh, crucial that we work with others. So um, in addition to the state of New Hampshire incident command structure, public health in itself has its own um, uh, incident uh, management team uh, that has uh, over um, 100 people uh, working towards um, uh, managing this particular outbreak. But this outbreak is touching every single sector, um, as you know, and so it's crucial that we work um, in an integrated way. Um, and um, COVID is affecting all of us, uh, all of our families, um, and uh, we still have to manage this outbreak. So um, we are doing that as a, a state, uh, both on the statewide level and in the community level. Um, so um, some of the challenges that we face include uh, sort of the pace of the response. You can, you, I'm sure that you're, you're experiencing that as well. It was fast, it's, um, it's, it's moving um, faster all the time and we're constantly having to adjust um, uh, the work that we're doing, uh, which is um, vital in ensuring um, that this response is going well, which it, which it truly is. Um, so uh, this is really cross-sector. The other things that we've had to do um, is really reach out uh, cross-sector uh, because everybody is being impacted and because of our subject matter expertise, we tend to be the ones to provide the guidance uh, relative to disease management. So um, I think this has, been, um, uh, uh, this has been a stressful time for all of us, uh, not just in the work of public health or in the state, though you're all experiencing this with your own personal lives um, and your work lives as well. Um, but we are in this together and we will get through this. And, um, and uh, I think our social work backgrounds really help us understand uh, how important it is that, uh, that we maintain our relationships uh, both on a work and a personal level. So if we might go to the next slide and open up a little bit more for some dialogue, we thought we'd have some summary comments. I do want to call out one of our um, wonderful colleagues who's on um, the webinar today too, and who leads one of our, plays a major leadership role on one of our integration teams. I think um, Elizabeth Fenner Lukaitis is on the phone, and she's done an amazing job um, leading our suicide prevention integration team. Um, Liz, do you have any thoughts you might want to share putting you on the spot? Um, putting me on the spot? No. Um, I mean, fortunately, right now, the numbers are low and calls to both headrest and the emergency service centers are low, but the conventional wisdom and talking with people is just kind of hunkering down before the storm hits, so to speak. Great. Liz, do you have any reflections? I know it's been almost two years since you all kicked off the suicide integration team. Do you remember what it was like in those first couple of meetings? I know I was at the first one, and, and the first thing we all noticed was many people around the table who had been at the department for a very long time didn't know each other. Um, and a lot of people did, and a lot of people were steeped in the work, and a lot of people were tangential. Do you have any reflections on um, the that particular, your, your experience in the integration team and what that felt like? Yeah, I think the thing that has been most exciting, and of course COVID stopped a lot of this, but we were doing what we called road shows and we were traveling to all the district offices. And, you know, in my little silo in the Concord area, I just assumed everyone kind of was familiar with suicide prevention and some of the standard resources. 
and just the questions that were asked when we went to the district offices was really amazing about how much education we have to do just internally, let alone out to the public. So it's been exciting at the same time. I know you all have come up with a lot of amazing ideas too to address suicide prevention, both in our work with clients and communities, but also with our own DHHS staff. Can you talk just a little bit about that? You've, I know that's wound up being a great, again, parallel process, I raised that, where you all worked, you were front facing and really concerned about clients and individuals and families experiencing um, suicide, but you also turned and, and looked at our own needs of, of our organization and our staff. Yep, there was a survey that was done of management staff, and at this point, I want to say maybe a year and a half ago, and just looking at what type of support would managers give for their staff learning more about suicide, and then a subcommittee formed, and we looked at probably about four or five programs very strongly, the pros and cons of each, and we settled on one um, QPR, Question, Persuade, Refer, and then we went into getting the whole contracting process, which anyone who's ever gone through that, the state of New Hampshire knows it can be a little burdensome at times. And we got that signed, GNC approved it, and then COVID hit. So we're kind of in limbo right now, but our plan is to have train the trainers in staff and um, to go to the district offices and train staff. And we've done, um, we have a intranet presence where people can ask questions. We have a lot of support listed ranging from the suicide prevention number to all the mental health centers and what they have. There's a link for the survivor of suicide loss packets that can sent out. Um, so we have a variety of different resources and we just met last week and we're talking about how can we keep the message alive where most things have come to a halt and focused on COVID. So we had some ideas around that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Liz. I, I, I really, we appreciate your adding in and thanks for being okay with me putting you on the spot there. Um, I just want to share um, in terms of, so ac across these couple of areas, applying a systems approach is critical. And we talked a little bit about that, Lisa did. Um, and then in terms of the leveraging our teaming and in integration efforts, I think many of us, and, and Elizabeth just talked about um, her experiences with one of our teams, but I think many of us had talked about that we've been able to step into COVID, I think a little more stable on our feet because we had these relationships again, both within and across our own department and down, down, down deep into the department, not just at the higher levels, but this is all the way down into some, some really front-facing um, staff. Um, but we've also developed and cultivated those more and more and more. I don't know that any one of us would say they're where we want them to be fully, um, but they're in the local level at the local level, in local communities, really, you know, sort of long stretching tentacles or threads that we've put out there that we've been able to pull on. Um, one of the examples that I shared in, um, from our super integration team during COVID was that we were quickly identifying that um, all, of these, all of these kids and families went virtual in terms of remote learning, right? And so um, many of them didn't initially have devices and certainly a lot of the schools offered to fill that need with devices. But then what happened really quickly is they ran out of minutes or they didn't have access to Wi-Fi. And so one of the things that we were able to do was because we had our super integration team meeting and the data we collected was both concrete quantitative data, but it was also ear on the ground it was people talking with other people, talking with membership associations and local organizations and family groups. You know, uh, we talk across a whole array of family advocacy groups um, here in New Hampshire. And what we heard was there was this gap that people, families and individuals were able to get a device, but, but they often didn't have enough minutes. They didn't have uh, wireless access or Wi-Fi. And many, of course, didn't know how to use the technology at that level either. And so we were able to partner with New Hampshire Charitable Foundation um, and with the United Ways across the state, several of them, to actually get families and individuals data plans, to get them more minutes, and to get them devices, and to get them some training and support. So that's a really, um, I think that was a really creative thing that we were able to put forth because we were all working together. Any one of us trying to solve that would have fixed it maybe for one family, um, one individual, but would have not necessarily been a cross-system solution. Um, I want to open up to Chris and Lisa 
um, to see if they had any last minute thoughts and then maybe we could answer some of the questions that we might have um, coming forward. So um, I just wanted to add that I, I'm always trying to look at the silver lining to all of this because in a relative, if anybody on this call knows state government, it works slow. And for somebody like me, and I know Lisa, who come from a community, it, we want everything to go fast and quickly, but just the ability that we had to enable our, I oversee our Bureau of Family Assistance, which does all frontline eligibility for all of our assistance programs, to get those staff to be able to work remotely has increased our ability to meet individuals and families where they're at and to provide them the strong benefits they need. And one of the neat things, the great things we've been doing is because we're trying to, you know, balance what staff have to do at home with children, right? Because everybody's doing remote learning. Some staff have had to flex their hours. And so we've been able to offer nighttime appointments for individuals and families. And so it's our hope that through all of this, we can continue some of these best practices that we're learning and trying and said, we've been able to do it. We've been successful to um, help us as we move forward when we know more and more people are going to need um, as our assistance once the additional unemployment benefits um, expire, once some of the additional staff stipends um, run out. So we know how are we positioning ourselves to be responsive in the future. Can I jump in? This is Lynn here. Can I jump in because we have, um, we do have 10 minutes left. And I know people have questions, but I'm going to take my prerogative here and ask the initial one here. Because, uh, like, Christine, one of the things that you brought up is this need for uh, students to have not only devices, but internet access. But one of the things that this is really showing now is these needs that have become amplified during COVID-19 crisis, but really are needs that need to be addressed outside of it as well. Not only do students need internet access and devices at this time of remote learning, but really all students need at all times access to devices and internet services. They shouldn't have to drive to McDonald's or the church parking lot in order to get on to, to Wi-Fi. This is a need for all times. The, uh, the ability to do telehealth, not only for medical, but for mental health and behavioral health, it's wonderful that we're able to do it now, but really we should, this should be an option open to everybody at all times and with insurance companies not paying at 70%. There are a number of uh, people should be able to be home with their kids because their kids are home and not have to worry about their jobs. Mm -hmm. So how we have 75 social workers on here, how do we best advocate and work within these systems to ensure that these, these Mm -hmm. programs and policies can yeah. remain in effect. Yeah, so I think, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Lisa. That's okay. So uh, I'm right there with you, uh, Lynn. Um, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of positive things that uh, we learned about uh, relative to the response um, and how we've had to manage it. And, um, you know, the, the idea of disparities has really sh been showing up in a way publicly that it has never had before, at least in my experience. And uh, to me, that's very exciting to hear those things being discussed um, in the way that they are being discussed. And then the policies that are coming out of the federal government relative to acknowledging those disparities um, uh, in some way has uh, really shown, um, uh, uh, really, really reinforced that issue. So how do we continue on the uh, ensuring access, ensuring that uh, people understand that populations are disparate and that we need more equitable uh, policies uh, across the across the country. And I think uh, we uh, number one, uh, we are stronger together than we are separately. Um, so when I think about um, the Public Health Association, the uh, NASW, and other associations, I think advocacy networks really have to come together. Um, uh, to show strength. I know if all of the advocacy groups have individual priorities, but really the only way we're going to pull this off and sustain uh, the good things that have come out of this and other things that uh, we need to band together uh, around our advocacy efforts. 
Chris, I know you were going to uh, talk about other things as well. I was only, and I just went ahead and put something in the chat. Um, so nationally, there is a conversation that's begun that we don't want to find the new normal because of COVID. We actually want a better normal. We want to actually try to seize these, pot, these disruptions and make them positive disruptions that have really shown a light. And, and thank you, Lynn, you've picked up on one that we all would agree. Why ever go back? To, be, to, to too many families, and frankly, too much of our workforce being virtually dark. We, we've really talked about why, why would we ever consider taking laptops away or taking devices away or taking this option away? Now, is there much to be learned about what works for the individual worker, professional, um, what works for a family and a particular child? Yes, there's a lot to be learned about that and we need to re to lean in and help to create the evidence behind that. Social workers need to advocate to be stepping in. Our research and evaluation partners, um, those of us who have a social work lens should be helping to do this evaluation because it will happen fast and people will decide what does and doesn't work. But anything that can be a positive disruption now, to be honest with you, we're, we're trying to hold on to it. We don't want to let it go. And we want to create data that says, oh my gosh, did you realize that, yes, um, people are engaging in telehealth at a really high rate. They want shorter visits. They don't want a full hour. They don't want a 50 minute hour. They'd like it more often. I mean, these are, I'm just hearing this anecdotally, but how do we, how do we use this information to rally the resources and address some of these structural inequities. And I know there was a question related um, to, to housing and homelessness, and Chris has really been leading our efforts along with some other folks from our integrated delivery network. So I wanna let Chris talk to that. So, um, hi, thank you for the question. One of the things we're working on, we um, recently received um, some uh, additional dollars through the CARES Act. And while we're looking at giving um, some of that money directly to shelters because we know the cost to provide services has gone up for them because they're look they're having to um, enhance social distancing and if any of you have been in a homeless shelter that's really difficult and so we're trying to assist them with some of that but we've also taken close to half of the um, dollars we've received and we're investing it in um, some permanent supportive housing because really our focus is on as we're looking to support people um, to social distance um, in the shelter, we should be looking for permanent housing for individuals. Also being prepared with our eviction funds, we received additional eviction prevention dollars this year and we're getting that out to our, um, the organizations we work with in the community because we know that people are gonna have struggles um, once the eviction notice is lifted. And so how do we make sure people are meeting um, their essential bills so that we um, don't increase homelessness? So we're um, targeting some of that. In addition, we are working with certain cities um, through the Emergency Operations Center to um, support people who are choosing to live um, in, um, a shell, in a tent or um, in a alternative location to keep people um, in, their, in their settings where they're most comfortable safe. And we've set up a couple of isolation and quarantine sites, which um, I think Nick Tumpas was on um, the call and his IDN has been extremely helpful in all of that. And, and I'll just add the, if you're not familiar, the, the IDN is the Integrated Delivery Networks. They were created out of a Medicaid waiver several years ago, and they've really compelled um, an integrated look through healthcare and um, behavioral health for um, high need individuals. And it's really been an, a pretty incredible wraparound experience and learning opportunity for us as a department, as a state in the local communities, particularly those I think over in the Seacoast area, the model has been very intense in learning about how to come together across systems, across social determinants of health. Lynn, did you wanna take any other questions? I know we're close to time. I'm gonna ask Becky, because I think Becky's been looking at the the chat, is there any questions that you'd like to bring forward or Chris Cummings? 
So there's a there's a lot of chat, talk about um, what's happening in the world of older adults. So I'm not sure exactly what the right question would be, but there's some discussion about a senior companion program and just knowing that that population is super vulnerable right now, that there's not as yeah. many supports that can go in and help them. Sure, I can, I can share just a little bit and I can certainly offer to help coordinate if folks have some questions to reach over. So um, Chris used, as Chris mentioned, she used to oversee our division of long-term supports and services. And a year ago, she moved into our role. I, um, our new division director there is, is Deb Sheets and I oversee that work with Deb. Um, what we, where we've been at this point is, is yes, this is, this is actually definitely been an area. So the individuals, the, the professionals and the volunteers, and frankly, the family members as well, who are trying to care for older adults um, have been deeply, like most profoundly affected by COVID, right? And in, in much of this is because of um, what, you know, what we know about COVID at this point is a caregiver could be asymptomatic and run the risk, right, of exposing adult. At the same time, we know that many of those who have been affected and gotten positive are, are the folks and resulted in um, becoming positive are in long-term care facilities. What we've done is a, a variety of things. So um, we have looked um, to increase the availability of um, things like PPE. We have looked to, most recently, we just established a long-term care stabilization fund which will um, infuse resources in to pay a differential for folks working on the front line um, in all of our long-term care um, settings and environments. So this is in home and community, as well as in residential care settings. I think the point that was made in the chat that I think is really inc um, incredibly important for us all to think about is there are not necessarily, there are gaps that now become larger gaps, back to your point, Lynn. So we had many vulnerable elder adults living at home, and I think Anne Marie used the phrase elder orphans, where they don't have anyone who was actually checking on them, who they were connected to, and they were sort of making it day to day. And this is where we've been trying to call for a heightened level of community collective responsibility for checking on your neighbors, checking on the person next door, noticing the person at the grocery store, um, you know, be, having an awareness. We have a reduction in calls to both our child abuse hotline and our adult Prote protective services hotline. Um, child protection is down by about 50%. Adult protection is down around 30 to 40%. We're monitoring that every week. And what we're trying to do is push out through informal networks, probably more than we have ever done before. Checking on people, giving them ideas about signs and symptoms. We've developed guides for people to actually be able to ask a set of questions about whether there's self-neglect or whether an elder feels at risk. Um, and, but we can only do this at this point with people really reaching out. And I see the Senior Companion Program highlighted. That's a possibility, but I think this is also, um, this is also each and every one of us um, sort of cumulatively taking responsibility to check on the people that live in and around us or near us or that we're wondering about. All right. Well, we have come to the end of our time. I know I could sit here for another hour or so, but I'd imagine you guys have some things that you need to do. Um, so I do want to thank uh, Chris, Lisa, and Chris for their time. Thank you so much. And I will remind, especially all of you social work students there who have been through policy one, you all know that it is through uh, crises that we've had our biggest uh, social changes and evolutions and revolutions. So within this uh, transformation and crisis, we'll all be looking for opportunities to increase social justice for um, for our people. And that's, that's a lot of the work of, of your NASW chapter right now. So again, thank you very much. If you are Remember, if you want CEUs, you need to type your full name into the chat, and I'll be sending out the evaluation and materials shortly. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Thank you Lisa. Thank, Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.
Hey, Becky, if you have a second, can you stay on? Yeah, and you're still recording, by the way. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop that. <laughs>